I've seen a lot of mystery shows in my day, and some supernatural shows, and the common thread between them is that they kind of fall apart as they go on. Obviously this is a generalization, and I have not seen every mystery show or every paranormal show, but it's a pretty common problem. At this point in pop culture criticism, it's basically common knowledge that these shows fall apart due to a lack of planning. If a mystery series is making shit up as it goes along while trying to surprise the audience, it's going to stop making sense at some point. And if an episodic paranormal show is constantly trying to up the stakes, eventually it's going to become absolutely ridiculous and stretch the audience's suspension of disbelief past a breaking point. Other people have already talked about this stuff to death, and I will leave links in the description if you want to know more about it. But today I want to talk about a paranormal mystery that actually succeeds at what it's set out to do. The Magnus Archives is a podcast written by Johnny Sims and directed by Alexander J. Newell. It ran from 2016 to 2021, and it's really, really good. It's an episodic horror story taking place at the fictional Magnus Institute, where the head archivist reads various statements about people's encounters with supernatural entities. It's got it all. Scary stories, mystery, an overarching plot, office comedy, office romance, office tragedy, a villain that's making straight men everywhere question their sexuality, and overall a really solid structure. If you listen to the Q&As put out by the writer and director, you'll hear them talk about how they planned the series from the beginning, setting up the layout for each season. Some things were definitely changed throughout the actual writing process, that's just inevitable and necessary when you're working on a long-running show, but in a general sense, they knew where they were going. But writing a good story doesn't just involve knowing where you're going, it's about executing whatever plan you have effectively. And I think the execution of the Magnus Archives is pretty brilliant, so I want to talk about it. And for the record, I said brilliant, not perfect. I do have a lot of criticisms of this show, and I'm definitely going to talk about those too, because honestly, even the problems with the show are interesting in their own right. Okay, let's go. Oh, spoilers, by the way, for the whole plot, the whole thing. Just, just spoilers. Okay, so the Magnus Archives has two separate plots going on. The episodic stories that can be listened to individually and the underlying meta plot. The former is where most of the mystery storytelling takes place, and it's a really engaging mystery. It starts off slow and almost undetectable at first. The main character, John, also known as the Archivist, is just reading out old scary stories that people have delivered to the Magnus Institute. Stuff like, a college student sees a ghostly inhuman figure asking for a cigarette. A woman's fiancé dies and she finds herself trapped in an empty graveyard. There's this goth kid who apparently murdered his mother and then skinned her? But she's kind of still alive? What the fuck, I hope we never see that kid again. Oh, also this Jürgen Leitner guy wrote a bunch of cursed books and John knows about this? Are more books gonna come up? And then you're like, wait, is the goth kid who killed the burn victim the same goth kid who killed his mom like eight episodes ago? Holy shit, the family of that girl's dead fiance funds the Magnus Institute? Did this famous YouTuber meet one of the missing people from episode one? The goth kid is back and he's looking for Leitner books? The name Michael has come up like six times. Are they all the same guy? <laughs> Who the fuck is Jurgen Leitner? He keeps coming up over and over again. Every day, Pepe's mail is getting sent back to me. Pepe Sylvia, Pepe Sylvia. I look in the mail. What well, this whole box is Pepe Sylvia! So yeah, as you can see, a lot of these stories connect in cool ways. And I've only mentioned like 0.2% of all of these connections. Furthermore, these stories are told out of chronological order, and sometimes the same scenario appears in more than one statement, told from different perspectives. This asymmetrical storytelling and odd doling out of information creates a mystery that's really interesting. It also makes for a great re-listen, since you can retroactively see what elements were set up before you even realized that they were going to come back. The audio format contributes to this too. You can't just see that the table from episode 3 matches the pattern on the box in episode 8. You have to pick up on clues that were mentioned and pay attention to what people are describing. And it's highly rewarding when all of the pieces start to fit together. There's a bit of a downside to this though. Technically, the Magnus Archives is a horror story first and a mystery second, and these two elements can mesh in weird ways. The horror element is really strong. Each story is completely different, sometimes focusing on psychological horror, body horror, or supernatural versions of more primal fears like 
heights, darkness, enclosed spaces, etc. Basically, if you're afraid of anything, there will be at least one episode of the Magnus Archives that gets under your skin. Johnny Sims can really sell his stories through both his writing and his acting. He plays John, by the way, and plagiarized his own birth certificate for the character name. For future reference, Johnny is the actor, and John is the character. Overall, he's really good at writing prose, and each narrator has a very distinct voice, even though the large majority of stories are being read by one character slash actor. Obviously, not every episode is a bullseye. Sometimes it's due to the subjectivity when it comes to what you as an audience member are scared of, and occasionally it's just weird writing decisions. I'm thinking specifically of episode 21, where the line, the sky ate him, is said, and it... <laughs> And it is the worst line in the entire show. The whole goddamn show. That's it. That's the number one worst line. But still, overall, the horror storytelling is incredibly solid. And some episodes even gave me brand new fears, like the unholy isolation of being in space, or the concept that someone you love could be replaced by someone completely different without you noticing. But here's the thing. A lot of good horror is based in the absence of explanation. Most of the episodes that gave me the most visceral reactions of genuine terror come from the first two seasons, because that's when the audience has the least amount of information. For example, in episode 2, a really terrifying coffin is introduced. It's creepy, it reacts very strangely to water for some reason, and appears to compel people to try opening it. By the end of the episode, the audience never finds out what's in that coffin, and that is a good thing. That is a huge part of what made that episode so unnerving. And then a few seasons later, we do find out what's in the coffin, and to be fair, the answer is both very creative and very scary, but it also takes a lot of the punch out of episode 2. No matter how fucked up your thing is, it's not going to compare to whatever the audience can conjure up in their own mind after such a creepy setup. This problem isn't just stuck in this one scenario either. There are a lot of early episodes that, while still good, seem a lot less creepy in hindsight after you learn more about the scenario. I don't think it's bad writing, but I do think it's a double-edged sword. Johnny Sims even mentions this sort of issue in the first Q&A. At the beginning, horror and mystery are fantastically good together oh yeah because they both rely on the unknown so heavily mm -hmm. uh, and so the unknown feeds the horror and entices the mystery but as it goes on the mystery needs to be it needs to get answers otherwise oh, yeah. you feel cheated whereas the horror needs to stay unknown because if you get all the answers to what the horror is it's no longer scary and if everything stays unknown and horrific, then you don't get any answers to the mystery. But yeah, to sum up, the narration is good, the ideas are creative, and seeing the mystery unfurl itself is deeply compelling. And for the record, the mystery elements aren't of the Sherlock Holmes variety. It's less about finding out who did the thing and more about discovering how all of these individual points are intricately connected, pulling on each other as they move, woven together like... Uh... What's the word? Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, mm, whatever, I'm sure it's not like a running motif or anything. One of the main reasons I stopped watching Supernatural is that it devolves into complete nonsense. At the end of season 5, the boys literally defeat the devil, and then the show... keeps going! Which would be fine, it's also largely an episodic show, so if they have more creative ideas, they could definitely keep going with it. In fact, there are some post-season 5 episodes that I thought were pretty good. But as they kept trying to outdo themselves with bigger bads, it got kind of difficult to suspend my disbelief, and the final nail in the coffin for me was the end of season 9, when Crowley basically points out to the audience that the main characters keep dying and coming back to life. So there are no stakes! The most baddest bad guy can always be defeated because some new thing can just come out of left field. And dying isn't even on the table as a threat since people have tons of ways of coming back to life. The Magnus Archives, while being a show based in the supernatural, notably doesn't bring anyone back to life, even though some very beloved characters die. I say notably because in the season 3 Q&A, Johnny even says, We made a point not to bring people back from the dead in Magnus. I know it sometimes feels like that, but we're very careful to never actually resurrect anyone. We're very keen to keep death meaningful yeah uh and it's, it's too important to horror exactly and so why obviously i mean gertrude's been dead the entire time uh <laughs> so we've heard plenty from her so i'm not gonna make any blanket statements that you'll never hear tim's voice again 
but Timothy Stoker is dead. Yes. Upon listening to this, I said, oh my god, these guys are the only writers left who at least kind of know what they're doing. Also, as far as plot progression goes, the Magnus Archives is low-key structurally perfect in the way the threats escalate in the underlying plot, both in terms of destruction and power and in terms of emotional consequences. Season 1 starts off with one major threat that's dealt with by the end of the season. Season 2 reveals the main villain. Season 3 lays out the grander forces at play. Season 4 ends the world, and Season 5 is about unending the world. The difference between Season 1 and Season 5 is vast, but how we got there makes perfect sense. As for the emotional stakes, let's talk about themes and characters. At the very end of Season 2, it's revealed that the supernatural happenings in the Magnus universe are the result of entities far beyond our understanding. Since their existence is so fundamentally different from what we can comprehend, they interact with the world through cursed items, creatures, and humans who have dedicated themselves to an entity. A lot of people read this as a metaphor for late-stage capitalism, and I am one of those people. A bunch of faceless entities exploiting humans through means of dehumanization and causing people to suffer because it feeds them seems like an appropriate metaphor. While we're on this topic, I do want to talk about Elias, since he's the main villain of the entire series and also one of my favorite villains of all time. The Magnus Archives is a series that deals with a lot of moral questions and has a lot of characters who do morally questionable things. So one might assume that the villain of said series is, you know, morally ambiguous and sympathetic to some extent, despite being the bad guy? Nope! No stops. Full bastard. It's great. He falls under what I've deemed the unbeatable boss archetype. He just doesn't tolerate insubordination or resistance, and that combined with his lack of empathy means that anyone who crosses him is either killed or brought to heal. His power set is cool too. On the surface, the ability to see out of any eye and read minds sounds useful but not deal-breaking, but the way he uses that power to manipulate people and anticipate threats yeah, it kind of makes him impossible to beat. He's just so evil, and he loves being evil, and every single fucking thing he does pisses me off and makes me want to kill him. It's great. Anyways, I think that Elias' role as the central antagonist is what makes the capitalist reading so common. He's the head of the Institute, he's wealthy, he's powerful, and he dehumanizes people in ways that are both brutal and chillingly indifferent. He seems like an appropriate stand-in through that lens. I also love how voice actor Ben Meredith plays him like he's trying to seduce the audience. That's... that's quite nice, actually. Tingly, but... sort of freeing. <laughs> you know... Even Gertrude never properly tried to compel me. It was only after 92 when he started to be properly, overtly villainous. Well, that's the thing. That everyone, everyone just decided how sexy he was. <laughs> um, so when we were planning that out, there was no way for us to foresee how sexy Elias would probably be. <laughs> Something I blame entirely upon Ben. With all of that said, I wouldn't call this critique of capitalism a direct allegory or anything. In much looser terms, this could be a metaphor for any power structure that exploits humans. Organized religion or cults might be even more on the nose, considering there's a lot of mentions of rituals and worship within the show. But if we boil it down to its barest aspects and focus on the Avatar characters, the Magnus Archives is a series about people becoming monsters, or at the very least becoming worse versions of themselves. That can mean a lot of things to different people in a metaphorical sense. The tense relationship between desperation and morality, the eagerness to please at the cost of one's own mental health, the psychological traumas that lead people down dark paths, and how personal choices can still be dictated and manipulated by outside influences. It's kind of heavy stuff, but it's put into a digestible package through the show's abstractions. Well, for the most part. There is some debate as to whether or not Daisy's arc was handled tastefully. While her demise and Basira's character arc were clearly meant to condemn police brutality and the deeply corrupt system that allows it to foster, it's still a weird subject to discuss in such a fantastical context, and there is a strange sympathy for the devil angle that can get kind of uncomfortable for some listeners. 
Okay, stepping back from that for a bit, let's talk about John and how he fits into this whole people becoming corrupted thing. John has one of my favorite brands of character arc, which is one based in deterioration alongside growth. The most obvious way this takes form is in his departure from humanity, as his relationship with the eye drives him to psychologically harm others, and he finds himself sympathizing more and more with the people he was afraid of, stating in episode 152 that anyone listening to his recordings might compare him to the other avatars that have had their minds and morals twisted. Over the course of the series, he is repeatedly traumatized, and the show makes a point that he is being both physically and emotionally scarred. These happenings are what drive his motivation for revenge in season 5, and he even states that revenge is making him a worse person. As a character, he is constantly berating himself and his own monstrousness, much to Martin's dismay. That's why the finale destroys me, but in the best way. Upon seeing that John has betrayed him and basically given himself over to the eye, Martin asks, how much of you is even left? And when John tries to reassure him that he's still himself, Martin's response is, how would you even know? This cuts right through me every time. Up until this point, Martin had consistently stood up for John and John's humanity, even in the face of Tim's doubt, Basira's mistrust, Elias being cryptic, and John's own self-hatred. This is the ultimate breaking point, the point where even Martin, the love of John's life, doesn't really recognize him. It's brutal, because at the end of the day, John is still himself. He's a deeply broken person trying to make the right decisions. We'll come back to the finale later, but for now I want to talk about the romance. John's emotional growth throughout the series is largely tied into Martin. Martin's the first person that John really opens up to, and this later grows into trust, which then turns into a genuine emotional connection. On the flip side, Martin's growth in season 4 is largely tied into John. Martin starts season 4 basically waiting to die but John's return gives him a reason to keep living, and he's later able to recognize his own value outside of the pure utility of you need to set yourself on fire to keep everyone else warm. Both of them give each other a reason to push onward, despite everything becoming more and more hopeless. It's a good romance. I wish the two had a few more scenes together before the culmination, but it is built up over the course of four seasons and comes together in an utterly fantastic confession. And yeah, the scene with Martin and John in The Lonely is cheesy as hell, but it is the highest quality of cheese. These are some gourmet nachos. Um, also kind of stating the obvious here, but it's pretty cool that the main character in this horror story falls in love with another man. You don't see that a lot, and it's cool that no one even makes a big deal out of it. It's just a normal romance, but with two guys. It's nice. I like it. So, they go to Scotland, they hang out, they're in love, Joan Elias starts the apocalypse through John, and the world ends, and then season five starts! Let's talk about season five! At the very start of this post, I said that supernatural mysteries tend to get worse as they go along, and I am deeply sad to report that I don't think the Magnus Archives is an exception. It just goes downhill in a very different way than its ilk. And so we're clear, I don't think season 5 tanks or becomes totally unlistenable. It's just, in my opinion, notably worse than the rest of the show. As discussed earlier, it doesn't fall apart due to a lack of planning, everything still makes sense, but the presentation has changed drastically. The episodic statements are no longer scary stories, but more like slam poems about the various hellscapes that John and Martin are trekking through. Honestly, if these were published in a book of slam poetry, I would probably think they slapped pretty hard. I genuinely believe that Johnny Sims is a good writer, but as a podcast, a lot of these statements just had me zoning out. There's at least four that I don't even slightly remember. Myself and many others have noted that they just aren't scary, unless there's a specific episode that really gets under your skin due to a certain fear or phobia. To quote my friend, it's harder to feel solid impact when the setting is literally divorced from reality. People would either go numb or insane to the point where their fears become unrelatable. 
And to be honest, I think that the same surreal Odyssey setup could have worked with a slight shift in narration. Two standout episodes for me were Strung Out and Wonderland. Both of them show the Torment target actively trying to resist and interact with their tormentor instead of just trying to escape or live through their situation. Strung Out is also more of a character study. You learn about Francis's life before the apocalypse through their interaction with the web hellscape. Meanwhile, Wonderland is just fucked. And you get to see John take the perspective of the first person bad guy throughout the whole thing, which is its own level of disturbing. But the majority of episodes feel so abstract that I kind of forget that the people trapped in them are supposed to be characters and not just concepts, so it's harder to feel their dread and pain. But I'm still here for the meta plot, the drama, and the romance. And when that's good, it's great! I think that the final handful of episodes are really solid in that regard. But a decent chunk of season five is dedicated to the Kill Bill plot. John discovers that he has the power to smite people, and while at first he's embarrassed about this, since he actively enjoyed killing not Sasha, Martin is super into it. He's encouraging John to murder people. This is actually the setup for a really good arc. As John gets more and more into his own avenging angel persona, Martin could get more and more disturbed by it. So by the time they get to London, Martin could be really upset that John is so willing to wreak his own divine justice by killing or torturing all of the avatars. And this does kind of happen. We do reach this end state, and it makes for a good final conflict. But the way we got here was... Th thematic gibberish, if you will. Throughout the journey, Martin is clearly motivated by a sense of justice. These people are bad, and so they should die. Whereas John is clearly more motivated by revenge. He only goes after the avatars that hurt him personally. At one point, John admits that maybe all of this killing isn't making anything better, but just making him worse. Martin apologizes for egging him on, and John absolves him by saying he started it. And then Martin's like, okay, I'll keep my apology then. <laughs> this is this is the second worst line in the entire series, right after this guy ate him. And it's close. But it kind of feels like we're back at square one. John is back to being ashamed of killing, and Martin is still keen on his justice stance, but now just less pushy about it. The arc is basically half resolved at this point. But then it doesn't matter because John kills Helen anyway, so John's back on his revenge justice thing. Then what was the point of his earlier revelation? Why have that if it's not going to matter and the conflict that was escalating still culminates with John leaning into the Avenging Angel stuff and Martin being disturbed by it? It just makes them both look like huge hypocrites. I fucking hate it when they're in the tunnels and Martin says, you weren't meant to enjoy it this much, regarding John smiting. Like, where did this come from? Why didn't you say this earlier? Third worst line in the series. And yeah, I'll say it, the boys fight too much in this season. I love their romance up to season five, and their cute moments and more low-key serious discussions are still good in this season, but God, they fight so much. And I'm not saying that couples can't have fights or tension. That's just realistic, and also stories need conflict to be interesting. Johnny Sims is on the record saying that balancing a healthy romance with the stress of a literal apocalypse was a priority, and I'm sorry, but I don't think it's well balanced. I'm just saying that sometimes it feels like they don't even like each other, and it really started to grate on me. Maybe it would have been better if the beginning of the season was dedicated to charming romance at first, so we as an audience could better appreciate how strong their love is and how it's truly being tested. But obviously, that was never on the table, so... You, it's fine, you can say it. What I did is I said, no one wants an office romance for ten episodes. <laughs> no one would enjoy that, Johnny. It's boring, so let's skip that and go straight to the misery. Have, have, have you actually seen the fan reaction? <laughs> Damn it, Alex! So yeah, I have a lot of problems with this season. I think it's the worst one by far, even though there is still a lot of it that I enjoy, including the ending. As I mentioned before, the moment where Martin confronts John in the Panopticon 
absolutely kills me, and John's reaction kills me even harder. Throughout the season, John had largely been motivated by revenge, martyrdom, and the subconscious call of the eye, and all three of those factors led him to his position as the pupil. He's getting revenge against the powers, sacrificing his humanity to get rid of the fears, and taking his place as the wearer of the Watcher's crown. But all of this gets thrown out the window when he realizes that Martin is going to die. And not only is Martin going to die, Martin is going to die specifically because he loves John and refuses to leave John alone to die horribly. Martin had always been an underlying motivation for John, his reason, as stated in episode 167. But now love as a motivator has come to the forefront, and John can no longer go through with his plan because of it. But at this point in the series, they're both utterly doomed, and John concludes that the only possible chance they have of surviving, however unlikely, would be to sever the pupil of the eye. Technically killing John, but maybe, just maybe, allowing them to escape with the fears. Whether that's meant to be literal or more ethereal is left unclear. Hell, maybe John's just making it up completely and creating his own potential for a happy ending. It's a pretty potent ending in emotional terms. John has to release the fears and Martin has to kill John, and those are the two things they said they were never going to do. The web, arguably the real main antagonist, basically won, and their manipulation of John worked. The destruction is spread, and there is kind of a bleak underlying tone to that. But at least this ending has some semblance of hope to it. I'm not saying that releasing the fears was objectively the correct moral decision. The entire point of the dilemma is that there was no objectively correct moral decision. But while John's solution does have merit, it was also the most hopeless. I think dramatically, any one of the choices on the table could have worked if the writing was well executed, but thematically, this one seemed like the perfect combination of grim and optimistic. Like, all of the evils that plague humanity can't just be defeated forever, and things could get worse, but maybe not. Maybe everything works out. So yeah, the Magnus Archives is a podcast, and it's a really good podcast. Great, even. I can complain about season five all I want, but regardless of how that worked out, you can tell throughout the entire show that the people working on it were trying to tell a genuinely excellent story. It's good. Go listen to it. Even though I spoiled the entire thing, and if you're still here, you've probably already listened to it. Listen to it again. <sighs> okay. Um... And recording.